start off, uh, we have some Boy Scouts here from Troop 164 who I'd like to invite up to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. For those of you wishing to join us, please rise. Boys, you can come on right down here. Thank you, gentlemen, and if you could please step up to the podium here. There'll be very easy questions, I promise. If you could just tell us your name and which troop you're with and uh, what you're uh, working on, your uh, badges that you're working on this evening, we'd appreciate it. So if you stand on the other side there and face toward us. And the microphone's right there. Great, thank you. Yep, if you can just step up to the podium right here. Mitch, can you show them where the microphone is there? Thank you. Yep. I'm Parker Swearingen. I'm working on, I'm from Troop 164, and I'm working on my communications and citizenship in the community merit badges. Welcome. Thank you. I'm Aiden Swearingen, and I'm also working on my citizenship in the community. Merit Great. Badge. Well, thank you all for being here, and thank you for leading us in the pledge this evening. I do want to confirm we do have a uh, quorum of the council here. All seven members are here this evening. Mr. Rothweiler, are there any amendments to the agenda this evening? Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, there are no amendments this evening. Thank you, sir. Uh, next on the agenda will be uh, general public input. Uh, but before we begin that this evening, uh, I'd like to open with just uh, a few remarks and a, a bit of discussion about developments in our community over the past week. As Police Chief uh, Kingsbury addressed last Monday at this council meeting, uh, there is an ongoing investigation of a sexual assault that occurred at the Fawnbrook Apartments earlier this month. At the heart of this incident is a five-year-old victim, a little girl and her family who I send my thoughts and my support and my love to, just as you all have. This young girl's safety continues to be protected through the work of law enforcement, prosecuting attorney's office, and various partner agencies. These partners continue to work together to bring justice in this case. Justice through the due process of our Constitution and laws and ordinances, and justice specific to the difficult circumstances of this case as it involves juveniles and has been sealed by the court. The three suspects have been charged. The two who had been in juvenile detention were released from custody late last week at the order of a judge. And in cases like these involving juveniles, release includes agreements tailored to the case to protect the safety of the victim and the public safety. There are many more steps in the proceedings to take place in this case before it is resolved by a judge. And as that due process in this case plays out, I urge our community to pause to pause to remember the victim, to pause to remember the process ahead of us, and to show faith in the law of our land that justice will be served. Through the discussion of this issue here in these council chambers, emotions have run high on both sides of this dais. When we speak from a place of emotion and without all the facts, we spread misinformation and doubts. And as tidbits of this not quite truth and suspicion spread, particularly in the world of instant and unchecked communication online, they were woven together into a narrative of falsehood. And when people who do not live in our community, who are not our friends and neighbors, who don't share our values and the positive experiences that we have in this community, when these people latch on to that story, and they spread it like wildfire over the World Wide Web. A story that is beyond the bounds of reason and based on emotion and fiction 
it paints a picture of our community that is not us. It paints one full of hatred and divisiveness. And it brands us all as individuals and as a community as something that we know we are not. This is not us as a community. For all our differences, I know that we have more in common than we don't have in common. We are friendly and neighborly, and we love this community with all of our hearts. It's why we live here and work here and play here. It's why we want to raise our families here. It's why we continue to invest in our future so that we can build on our collective prosperity and give opportunity to others to join us, the same as the pioneers who came here and founded this region and settled here and found new promise in the Magic Valley. And it's why when we hear the report of a terrible crime, we step up and do our jobs to protect and support the victim and the safety of everyone in our community. As we move forward, I encourage us to do this in unity. I'm certainly not saying that we're going to agree on everything. But as we discuss these things, we need to do it based in fact and good information, and we must all keep our emotions in balance with our logic. And we need to do that honestly and respectfully. So I would ask this evening, as you come forward to address the City Council, that you please keep in mind the common goals that we have instead of the divisiveness that has been painted about our community in this past week. And that you be honest and respectful. And I will speak for myself that I will do the same with you. So with that, I would welcome members of the public to come forward to address the council. Is there anyone who wishes to come forward and address the council? Please. And for the record, please state your name. Julie Ruff. Thank you. First of all, I acknowledge that, at least I understand, not reading the article, that there were threats lobbied against someone or more than one person on this council. So I will petition my God Elohim by Jesus Christ for your security, each one of you, for your family's security. And I will pray that you are safe. No harm will come to any one of you or to anyone you love or this community. And that the perpetrators of this crime, which is grievous, will be found out brought to justice, and obviously incarcerated, if need be. Many of you are my friends, and I care about you as people. I've respected what you have, all, have committed to doing in this community, and like I said last week, this is an honorable seat. I want to acknowledge you, Ms. Hoggins, for your excellence last week during a very fiery meeting. You are an example to your peers. And I appreciate you keeping calm, speaking calm, and allowing the community to actually have emotions about something that they should have emotions about. This is something that we do come together with. Thank God we come together and we're emotional about this type of issue. What type of people would we be if we were not emotional about the rape of a small child? I would advise, again, to consider in any decision made forthcoming that we do, that you do, together agree that the security of this community be held higher than any other desire for economic gain or otherwise. That the security of this community be the priority in your mind as you make decisions about who is or who is not going to be sought out and brought into this community, no matter what group they are from. I'd like to be a little personal. There's a little person 
who is afraid to go out of her house, who wears two pairs of underpants to protect herself now. And she can't go out of her house because her perpetrator is still living next door. So who has become the prisoner after being dragged and attacked and violated? Who has become the prisoner? It is the family who can't afford to move because of poverty. And I think we all know that poor people in our community are the primary victims of crime. And it remains true in this case. And there is a secondary offense when someone is not safe to go out of their house because their perpetrator remains their neighbor. I'm not certain if this is the way Idaho always governs violations for people under 18. If it is, I think we need to address that as a state. We need to address that as a city. Perhaps we need to amend how we do things in order to protect underage people when they are violated by a peer. And instead of looking at two and three years as having a big significance, look at the actions that were perpetrated by the offender. We are responsible to keep her safe. She does not have the power to do that. I don't have the power to do that. I can only petition my city and my police department to do that. I know that they have already received an eviction notice, among other things, and they are still there. And this little boy is still in the neighborhood playing with all the other children while his victim is held inside of her apartment to be safe. She's trying to recover. How can she? I'll end being religious once again because it's important to me that we have that religious freedom no matter what faith we are. Righteousness exalts a people, but sin is a reproach. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Ruff, for your comments. Senator Well, anyone else who wishes to address the council this evening? Please come forward, sir. My name is Russ Krause, and I live here in Twin Falls. And I was going to talk last week, and as I told Don, I think that the council had been beaten up on quite enough, and anything I might say would would not make any sense. But having moved here, well, let me tell you, about a year ago, I did speak to this council, and that was in opposition to the uh, refugees. And I haven't been back until last week. Um, and now I'm, I'm thinking more and more about it. But there are some things that bother me about Twin Falls. And you may not remember my face, but you might remember the statement that I made that I could move out of Twin Falls right now and it wouldn't bother me because I didn't like what I saw coming from Wisconsin to Idaho. Um, some of the things that Don and I talked about also just a few minutes ago, I've noticed um, either a lack of zoning or a lack of follow through on zoning. I see houses going up next to uh, more modest houses. It's almost like there's no plan. And we all know if there's no plan, uh, any road will take you to, to that end result. Your roads need help. Uh, excuse me. Our roads need help. I am a, a, a resident of Twin Falls. Uh, there are some roads that are like going over a washboard. Um, two things in particular that I think the council should take a look at because you probably see it or look at it but never see it. And that is approximately four miles west toward Filer on the south side of the road. There's a house up on 
um, it almost looks like they could drive it away and it looks like the whole front end has blown apart. That house is not moved, but that's the first thing that people see as they get off of Highway 93 coming down 30 to come into the city. And then when you get to uh, Rock Creek, there's a Twin Falls, welcome to Twin Falls. The sign that says welcome to Twin Falls almost could say don't come back. That is one of the, I'll use the word ugliest signs I think I have ever seen going in and out of the city. It just, it's, it's not a friendly, warm-hearted greeting when you come in. And it's right on, again, on the south side of the road and right across from the old hospital. Um, and by the way, thank you for fixing this. It wasn't fixed last week, and it was flopping all over the place. Uh, uh, and I was going to bring up the fact that when I did speak to the council about a year ago, someone said, well, it's a, it is a problem, and we're going to fix it. It wasn't fixed as of last week, but it seems to be right now. And uh, if I might suggest, I think Twin Falls has to get its house in order before it starts going out and continuing on the refugee program, continuing on all of the um, other programs that that I'm a Christian, and it, it kills me to say this, but I think that things have to go into a logical uh, uh, progression. And for heaven's sakes, I would hate to see this city, my city also, get into the same thing that Europe is potentially getting into <coughs> right now, because that would that would destroy Twin Falls. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, thank you and your council for hearing some of these things. Thank you, Mr. Kraus, I appreciate your comments. Is there anyone else who would wish to address the council at this time? My name is Terry Edwards. I just wanted to say that I wasn't going to speak today, but then after this mayor's uh, soliloquy, which was very well thought out, very well planned, I just wanted to ask each one of you, it's been 25 days now since this incident occurred, what have you done personally to soothe and comfort the victim or the family? other than turning it over to the police department and washing your hands of it. So my concern is is that you have little concern because we would have heard about this this week following when we brought this to your attention. In fact, we were almost chastised and called by at least one person nearly a racist, racist that we were connected with racist groups. So the community comes and tells you things, turns out to be maybe not specifically totally accurate, but this little girl was violated. And you guys chastised us for bringing that attention to that to your attention. I don't understand it. You're supposed to be compassionate. We elect you folks. I don't. I don't live in Twin Falls. I own property in Twin Falls, and I'm concerned about it. But we, the people elect you to be compassionate, to hear the, the city council uh, members and different views and the, and the city, when they come to you, they're concerned. Do you think we would have walked down here and come to you because we just made something up? And by you guys not putting your foot forward first and getting ahead of this issue, this is what you've brought on your own heads. And it's a shame, but this is what's going to happen in the future if you don't <coughs> step up and do your job and get ahead of the issue instead of trying to sweep it under the carpet. How long is it? How long was it before anybody even reported it in the paper? 
So, sir, I, I appreciate your concerns that you're sharing this evening. Some of what you were discussing right now is the exact components of uh, not quite truths that I'm concerned about. This crime was reported when it occurred. It was investigated when it occurred. And our job as council members is not to investigate crime in this community. Nobody's asking you to investigate it. Excuse me, I was talking and you interrupted my, my comments here. What I was saying is that it was reported and you none of you had a clue. You didn't know anything about it. I heard each one of you that spoke, well, we didn't know that. We haven't heard anything. We don't know anything. And we're sitting there with our hands in the air going, what? <clears throat> you mean doesn't the, the something that serious and since you're over the police department, what I understand is that's one of your departments, why aren't you having a liaison come in here and brief you on these situations so that you know what's going on? So you don't have to look like a bunch of bumps on the log. And embarrass yourself I, I and embarrass this ask community. For respect, sir. Bump on the logs and not showing respect and not showing knowledge of the things that go on in this community. You embarrass yourselves. You are an embarrassment to this community, and it needs to change. Not all of you were, because there are some people that actually stood for something here. But most of you haven't. From, your, from experience, we've seen it. We saw what you did. We saw what you said. We heard what you said. It's recorded. It's not, it's not conjecture. It's fact. And sure, it goes viral, because people don't like this kind of attitude. You, you're supposed to support all the people. I think it was you that said, Mr. Mayor, that you support everybody, that we all treat everybody equally. They're all under the law. We treat them all equally. Well, you're not treating this girl equally from what I've seen and the experience that I've witnessed on, in the media and comments that have been made by, by uh, I don't think you guys have even made any comments at all. Everybody else has ch checked in on it and made some comment. Except today, now you come out with this beautiful story about how you're so concerned. Why didn't you throw that concern when we first brought it to your attention and say, wow, that really is something we got to look into. But instead, we write down questions with our names to get answers so you have time to cook up some kind of a, a <clears throat> report that covers everybody's tale. Why couldn't you just spontaneously a uh, answer the question? So I'm asking you, what have you, each one of you done since this occurred personally to support that girl? Not calling the police chief, finding out what the details were, calling the, the federal prosecutor in Boise and complaining to them. And I think, this, I think you, Mr. Rockweiler, are one of them that uh, said that you were going to return all these people that uh, had letters sent to their houses talking about uh, Jesus Christ and, and the Quran versus the uh, Bible and report it to the FBI. I think that's been uh, reported in the, in the media. I don't recall that statement at all, Mr. Edwards. I apologize. Um, you don't have to apologize, but I think, I think that was reported by our, our news media here. And that was not just recently. This was back a year ago. I, I, some letters mailed out there was a comment in the newspaper and it, they referred to you. You said, bring them to me if you get them. I will report them to the FBI and the proper authorities and the police. So we'll go back and look, but okay. again. I wish, I wish that you were that enthusiastic, if that's the case and that turns out to be accurate, that you were that way with this, this situation that we have before us now. Sure. <laughs> So are you guys going to answer my question, or do I have to write it down on a piece of paper and give you my contact information for you to come back later and give me an explanation? No comment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. Is there anyone else who wishes to address the council? My name is Heather Stroop, and I live in Twin Falls. <clears throat> Heather, could you please speak up so that yes. this meeting is recorded so that that can be heard? You can pull that down. Okay, thanks. 
Heather Stroop and I live in Twin Falls. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't appreciate the parts of your letter in which you seem to be saying that there are liars in this community who are who are actually just concerned for the for the welfare of this little girl and her family. Um, and I, I believe probably it's offensive to others who really just want the truth. <clears throat> um, and that's why we, we're here, really. Because all of us are concerned with lawlessness. We're concerned with lawlessness wherever it is found, whether it's in the community from perpetrators or whether it's under the cover of darkness somewhere in uh, government or law enforcement. We don't want lawlessness in our community. We want to be protected from all lawlessness wherever it's found. And <clears throat> the group of us, <clears throat> excuse me, have been getting together on Wednesday nights and praying somewhere in the city that lawlessness will be uncovered. And I believe that my God, Elohim, will answer that prayer and lawlessness will be uncovered. Thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else who wishes to address the council? Seeing none at this time, we will. Uh, yes, sir, please come forward. <clears throat> you need to wait till you get to the microphone, please, sir, since it's recorded for the record. My name is Scott McKinney. I live here in Twin Falls. Thank you. Uh, I wasn't going to speak today, but I've been bothered by what I've heard about the kids. And I'm here for the kids, not just for the girl, but for all of them. They're juveniles. They're not adults. From what I understand, they, the little girl was not raped. I don't think that these little boys should have to go through anything horrific over this, from what I understand, although it was not right. We have to be very careful how we treat children. I think you're doing the right job. I think the prosecutor is doing the right job. I think a lot of this is religious, and it's wrong. We have laws that protect children. I want to let you know that I am in favor of protecting the children. I'm disgusted with uh, what's taken place here because I think a lot of it has to do with fear. Does it not? Do we not all fear today because of the things that are going on throughout the world? Well, the things that are going on are because of religious extremism. People who think they know God and have the truth. God is in all of us. He's not in one belief system. I think a lot of this has to do with the people here that are coming from other countries. The what is it? The uh, the group we the, the people that are helping the people here. Uh, refugees. I think a lot of this has to do with the re refugee camp. I think people are scared. They don't want these people. <coughs> To me, I'm 100% in favor of helping these people. These people are trying to escape murder, brutality. I'm in favor of helping people try to escape this. Little kids trying to escape hunger, being killed in this country. I'm not in favor of people going nuts and killing other people. But why couldn't we as a community help these people get to know these people, wouldn't that be better if we knew them and we helped them rather than just point our finger at them and put them all in a big group that they're Muslim? It's like the Christian right thinks that they're right. Nobody's right. The God that we share is in all of us. God doesn't hate the Muslims, doesn't love the Christians. He loves all. We are always to forgive, are we not? In your life, when you don't forgive, what happens? You suffer? Yes? These are our brothers and our sisters, regardless 
of where they come from, what color they are. The only thing that makes us different, because we're all flesh people, is the way we think. And I suggest it's time for us to start to forgive, start to love, and start to help. Then we'll get to know things better. And what better way to change anything through, but through our example? Is that not true? You're going to force somebody to change? What they think, what they believe, no. Anyways, I wanted to say I was in favor of this group of people and the prosecutor not giving any information out that is not necessary to this public to protect all these children. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Mr. McKinney. My name is Twyla Chapman, and I am from Kimberly, Idaho. I have to say personally that this gentleman that just spoke does not know what he's talking about. We are talking about a five-year-old girl that has gone through horrific incidents that nobody's saying what it is. I understand that the case is stilled. We just need to take care of her right now. The perpetrator is living still next door. She can't go outside. There's other families involved in this. They can't go outside. They are afraid of what's next door. What are we doing to help her with this? We need to take the main concern of all this is not hatred. It's just we need to take care of this little person. And from personal experience, they are totally afraid. Still, this five-year-old girl has gone through a whole lot. They will not open it. I totally understand. But I know personally what has happened. And we are, it's not hate, love, whoever we are. It's what has happened to her by three older people that she didn't even know what, what, what was happening. Thank you. Thank you. Counsel. I'm John Haight, and I spent about 15 years on volunteer for juvenile probation. And I understand a little bit of where you guys are coming from and where Travis is coming from, you guys can't say anything about a juvenile case. I've sat on diversion board for years, and I once the people walk out with a juvenile, and that's all diversion board is, is juveniles. I don't say a thing, and you can't either. And I admire you for not getting back in the paper and throwing mud, because we have rules and laws, and these laws, they hit all of us. And juvenile law, I was around when juvenile law changed, changed for the better. I was volunteering in the prison system when the juveniles were kept with the adults. That's how long I go back. At least now they're separated, and you guys did fine. You guys don't need to talk to the press. I don't elect you to talk to the press all the time. It's enough. Thank you, Mr. Hayden. Hello, my name is Nolan Stroop. I suppose I cannot agree with every sentiment that has been expressed here before because I believe there is such thing as right and wrong. I recall hearing nobody's right or everybody's wrong or whatever it was. Nobody's suggesting that any children go through anything horrific, but I'm sure you all agree that justice needs to be done and we do have a juvenile justice program. I'm hoping we're all on the same page here. Thank you, Mr. Stroop. Is there anyone else who would like to address the council at this time? Seeing no one, we will move on with the rest of the council agenda this evening. Uh, next item for consideration is the consent calendar. Council wishes. Chris Talkington. Move approval is printed. Second. Uh, 
motion by Chris Talkington, seconded by, is that you, Nikki? Yes. Seconded by Nikki Boyd to approve the consent calendar as presented. Is there any discussion? Nikki Boyd. Yep. That's okay. You're fine. <laughs> Seeing no discussion, Sharon, roll call vote, please. Suzanne Hawkins. Yes. Nikki Boyd. Yes. Sean Barriker. Yes. Chris Talkington. Yes. Greg Lanting. Yes. Don Hall. Yes. Ruth Pierce. Yes. Motion passes 720. Under items for consideration, we have presentation of Peace Officer Standards and Training Council Certificates uh, to Officer Matthew. Oh, man, I'm going to slaughter that one. Gialta. Uh, Officer Simon Rodriguez, Detective Javier Paredes, and Detective John R. Wilson. My apologies for my mispronunciations there. <laughs> I have Craig Stotts and Chief Kingsbury. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to celebrate the success and achievements of our police officers. Obtaining levels of certification in our profession takes into account years of experience, education, training, and dedication. You have a police department full of professionals that take their job very serious, and you should be proud. After reading each officer's bio, um, I would ask Chief Kingsbury and Mayor Berger to please come forward and present the certificates and pose for a photo with our officers. Uh, this evening, we're pleased to present, actually, I think three certificates, unless Officer Jelt is here. He is not here. So the first certificate we'll be presenting tonight will be the intermediate certificate to Officer Simone Rodriguez. Simone, could you please come forward? Simone Rodriguez was hired by the Twin Falls Police Department as a full-time police officer on April 14, 2008. Yeah, thank you. Simone was born in Pocatello, Idaho. He and his family moved to Twin Falls when Simone was seven years old. He graduated from Twin Falls High School. Simone started working for Albertsons at age 16, and during his 14-year employment with Albertsons, he worked his way up to grocery manager. Simone has served on the police de uh, department since actually in the patrol division, um, and in 2013, he became a school resource officer. Simone is currently assigned to O'Leary Middle School. Simone and his wife, Brianna, have four daughters and twin sons. With six children, Simone doesn't have a lot of spare time, but when he does, he enjoys fly fishing. <laughs> Simone was awarded his post-basic certification on October 20th of 2010, and it is with great, uh, excuse me, great pleasure that we present Simone with the intermediate certification from the State of Idaho Peace Officer Standards and Training Council. I could have Officer uh, Javier Paredes please come forward. Javier Paredes was hired by the Twin Falls Police Department on December 10th, 2007 as a full-time police officer. Javier was born in Twin Falls, Idaho and graduated from Twin Falls High School. He attended the College of Southern Idaho and graduated with an Associates of Arts degree in business. Prior to his employment with TFPD, he was a personal banker with Wells Fargo Bank. During his tenure with our department, Javier has served in the patrol division, narcotics unit, and as a SWAT team member. Javier is also a post-certified instructor in ground fighting. Javier was awarded his post-basic certification on December 22, 2008, and his intermediate certification on May 1, 2012. Javier, it is with great pleasure that we present you with the advanced certification from the State of Idaho Peace Officer Standards and Training Council. Detective John Wilson, please come forward. John R. Wilson was hired by the Twin Falls Police Department on March 20th, 2006 as a full-time police officer. John was born and raised in northwestern Montana. 
He graduated from Knoxon High School in Knoxon, Montana. He served two and a half years with the Montana National Guard and four years in the United States Navy serving on submarines. Prior to his employment with TFPD, John worked with the Twin Falls School District for 10 years as the district plumber. From November 2003 to March of 2006, John worked as a patrol officer with the Kimberly Police Department. John was awarded his post basic certification on May 24, 2004 and his intermediate certificate on November 20, 2009. During his employment with Twin Falls PD, John has served in the patrol division and is currently assigned to the criminal investigation division as a case detective. John is a member of the crisis negotiations unit and the honor guard. John has been married to his wife Marilyn, who I believe is here, for 30 years and they have two daughters, Darcy and Echo. John and Marilyn have two grandsons. Their granddaughter Danica was born last week and they are expecting another grandson in September. It is with great pleasure that we present John with the advanced certification from the State of Idaho Peace Officers Standard and Training Council. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Stotts. Congratulations, gentlemen. Thank you for your continued dedication to service to our community. Next on the agenda is consideration of a request from Brady Dickinson of the Twin Falls School District to waive the building permit fees for a new equipment storage shelter located at 1155 Highland Avenue East. And we have Chair Morty from our So I'll just have Brady come up and describe the project, and if you have any questions for me, I'll be right here. Welcome, Dr. Dickinson. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Brady Dickinson, Twin Falls School District. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, um, we have a maintenance yard that's located out on Highland and we would like to build a small structure to park uh, basically yard equipment, uh, tractors underneath to get it out of the weather. Um, generally, uh, we have a long-standing relationship with the city, and in the past, the city has waived building permit fees to the district. Um, we share facilities. The um, Park and Rec is able to use our facilities. We use city facilities. We're both supported by uh, tax dollars, and so I would once again come before you to ask um, a waiver of this fee. I have to answer any question you might have. Chris talked to <laughs> Mitch, what would the fee structure be for this? Oh, okay. can probably do the handoff. So it should be in the staff report. Mm -hmm. um, total fees that I have $1,100, run $1,100, okay. $1,114.99. Okay, thank you. And the impact fees will be assessed. This is just a plan review of building permit fees. Thank you. That was going to be my clarification for the audience and those people at home. It's not all the fees. It's just those two. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Greg Lansing. Mayor, are we ready for a motion? I believe so. Mayor, I move that we waive the building fees for the maintenance building that's being built at the Highland Avenue for the Twin Falls School District. Second. Motion by Greg Lanting, seconded by Don Hall, to uh, approve the request to waive the building permit fees. Suzanne Hawkins. Thank you. This might be better after the vote, but I'm going to take a stab in the dark that um, this is probably going to pass the council. And I just wanted to mention, last week we were at the Association of Idaho Cities annual conference, and it was my pleasure and honor to host a roundtable meeting of council members where they could ask any questions and it was just a group from all over the state talking about issues that come up in their cities and the main topic was do any of the cities waive fees for school districts and other like government agencies and it made me it made me very proud that the city of twin falls has such a passion for working with others in our partnerships and those that we team with because I learned that we're one of the very few cities that has that relationship and most of the other cities um, wouldn't even consider 
this request, and so it made me very proud to represent our city and have a chance to talk about partnerships and common goals and hopefully gave some of the other cities things to think about. So, Thank you, Suzanne. Greg Lanting. Oh, oh, sorry. Brady, I Brady? So. I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to add that um, the school district is very appreciative of the, the city and the partnership that we have. We always seem to work really well together in projects, and I think it benefits us mutually. So thank you very much. I agree. Thank you. Greg Lanter. Well, one of the things, I'm not going to defend the other cities, but obviously our situation is maybe slightly different in the fact that we, our school district, is outside the boundaries of the city of Twin Falls, but really not very far, whereas other places like, let's give me an example, like Beulah or Filers, Cass Fort, some of those, most of it's farmland outside the city, and so it may not be quite the same feeling, that, but I I echo what uh, Brady said and what Suzanne said. I'm, I'm glad for our cooperation between the city and the school districts. It's been that way for a really long time, and uh, I, I can't imagine the other cities not getting along like we do with our school district, but I know other cities do struggle, and I'm not sure whose fault it is. I'm not placing blame. I just know it occurs. Thank you. Any other discussion from the council? Seeing none, Sharon, will call vote, please. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Sean Barriker? Yes. Chris Talkington? Yes. Greg Lanting? Yes. Don Hall? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. The motion passes 7 to 0. Thank you, Brady. Next on the agenda is consideration of a request to approve the purchase of real property located at the northeast corner of Addison Avenue West and Monroe Street. We have our public works director, John Caton. Welcome, John. Thank you, Mayor and Council. So we were recently <coughs> approached by the property owner of 277 and 285 Addison Avenue, and that is That's these two lots right here. This is Monroe, and this is Addison. Right across the street is Lincoln School. And um, the, the property owner um, has been taking care of the, this property for, a few, for several years, take care of the weeds and that sort of thing. And recently, this person's health has degraded to the point where they, they need to either sell the property or do something different. So they've been actively trying to sell it. The problem with this piece, as you can see, there's um, some utilities that cross this property. This is lateral 42. It's one of the largest laterals, if not the largest lateral in, in the city. And it runs underneath, if you remember, there's, um, it runs underneath the sidewalk along Addison. Um, west, turns northwest and goes behind back lot lines. Um, Did you have a question? That you want yeah, to just real quick, John. Could you explain to the audience, those that don't know, what a lateral is? Oh. <laughs> just say sounds yeah. really important. <laughs> just, just just say underground canal. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That's all you got to do. It's just an underground canal, <laughs> and it, pro you. it provides irrigation to to the to the uh, from Twin Falls Canal Company. This map's a little bit harder to see, but. Right here is the intersection of Monroe and Addison. Again, lateral 42 comes from the, from the east, moves west, goes back lot lines, and crosses here, um, uh, or goes to Washington and crosses in between Shoup and Habern. Um, the city has uh, maintenance responsibilities for laterals anytime they cross underneath uh, roadways. Also, every now and then, there's a, there's a maintenance agreement on uh, particular segments of of irrigation. This one, this particular one, has uh, a maintenance agreement along its length and back lot lines from that we that we have. So from the Twin Falls Canal Company, we have the maintenance on this on this facility. And, and so that is is this this here, and we also have a sewer line here. Um, obviously, when you look at this lot, <coughs> corner lots have setbacks on both sides front setbacks that are significant, 20 feet, I believe in this, 20 feet here. 
So it really limits what you can do this, with this property. Plus, you can't put a footing on top of a utility like that, and you wouldn't want to even if you could. So the, the property has arguably little value to many people um, and arguably reasonable value to the city of Twin Falls for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, that, that underground lateral it is large and difficult to maintain, so this would provide us a, a great location to get in safely and reconstruct that in the off season when it's not flowing. Um, the other opportunity um, is a long time from now uh, when it makes sense to potentially retrofit irrigation in downtown. Um, it's very costly. Right now it does not financially make sense. <clears throat> but as you know, when, uh, when there's an opportunity to buy a, a piece of property that could, to, could potentially uh, be a part of that, um, so what, I, what I've done here is taken an, a page out of our water facility plan, and this shows um, options to retrofit PI. So as you know, in the old parts of town that, that use potable water, it would be a real opportunity for us to retrofit with PI and use irrigation water. So this, this law is about right here in this, what we're calling uh, phase three of a, of a PI retrofit, and it's, it's a great location. For a, lot, for a lot of reasons. Um, it's on the high ground. Um, it also has the lateral that we could deliver shares to. It, it, so engineering-wise, it makes, it makes a lot of sense. <coughs> Cost-wise, it makes no sense at this point. But someday, the, the value of water will be there, and it'll, it'll make sense. So for those two reasons, I'm recommending that we go ahead and purchase the property. The tax assessed value in the staff report, the tax, it's difficult to, to uh, determine a value. Uh, because of the situation here, the tax assessed value is 59000 for those two lots. Um, the property, uh, the seller is asking for a purchase of $20,000 for both lots. Thank you, John. Chris Talkington. Uh, John and Travis, I'd really like to um, push the envelope of, envelope of comfort on this and say, why are we going to wait for some indefinite time to start utilizing, expanding that lateral to take our dependence off of potable water by making the PI. Is there not some long lead planning item that we can still incorporate into this uh, coming year's budget? Uh, we always have capital money available some form or fashion. I, I don't want to sit here three and a half years when I go off the council and be talking about someday. Uh, the more <coughs> dependence off of our potable water, the quicker, the better. Other than so, that, I'll vote for it. So I think that what John's trying to do is, is to make sure that the situations are right so when that opportunity presents itself, we are not landlocked without the land to be able to be there. And, and while there might be a source of water to be able to get into that area, we still have to go out and make sure that the water rights are able to be spread across those properties. So you look at acquisition of water rights. And then after that, you need an entire distribution system that isn't available in that area right now. And our water facility plan estimated that it would cost about $19 million to transform that area from a potable water to a, a pressurized irrigation system. Um, not to mention potential impacts and costs to the individual homeowners then to take that water and to be able to apply it to their properties. That $19 million is, is, is our cost. Um, when we start looking at spending $19 million from a cost-benefit analysis, we believe that the $19 million is best served by taking a look at Sunnybrook Springs by taking a look at additional storage, by taking a look at m land that we could buy that have a more immediate direct impact um, and, and value for that dollar. Just to add to that, if I could. Well, uh, if I could just follow up as one piece, then it has to be a complete $19 million project. There cannot be a phased introduction of this that would be $5 million or something of that nature. It's all or nothing, in other words. Well, the, if I could just answer that. The, the whole area, if we if we retrofit the entire area, it costs that much, and what we would get is 1.5 million gallons per day at peak use in savings, which is which is something. But we can right now for a cup, you know, for a couple million, if we can find water out south, and we do have a well that we have developed here recently, 
we can potentially, the, the cost per millions of gallons that you can either conserve or find um, is factors away in cost. Um, but really, uh, <coughs> Councilman, uh, go ahead, Josh. Well, so the, so the challenge that we have is, I mean, to put the 19 million or 5 million or even a million dollars in perspective, the entire water fund budget for the upcoming fiscal year 17 year that we're currently working on, we'll present to the council the first week in July. That entire budget uh, is estimated to be right around the $10 million mark. And, and that $10 million mark, probably 40% of it is associated with debt and debt service. And then you have another large portion of it that is going to be associated with personnel to make sure that the system's running. Um, spending, f we, we have historically been able to take and, and save monies from revenues that are not expended in any given year and collect them over a period of time and then apply them to long-term projects to be able to help offset without having to go out to a debt measure. Uh, the Wills Booster Station is one of those projects that we've been able to, to save money over a couple of years and then apply that to a long-term capital project. The same is true here, but then it comes to a matter of priorities. Is it more important to get 1.5 million gallons off of potable water during peak, or does it become more advantageous for us to buy land and be able to have a 10 million gallon storage facility located in an area that could be of a more direct and beneficial use today? And so what John wrestles with is what does that look like, recognizing that we couldn't just collect $5 million in a single fiscal year without devastating the ratepayer. And, and then you start looking at having a long-term uh, debt instrument if you don't have those cash reserves available. And so um, we'll continue to look at these things. I, th I think the value of the water facility plan is it pro does provide that roadmap, but it provides the roadmap in terms of greatest return for our dollars today and it kind of keeps those opportunities out there in the future for us to have awareness of. So when land comes available, John is in a position to, to move forward. Don Hall. John, just out of curiosity, because I know that some parts of, that town, of, of our town in that area, maybe not down uh, that far west, mm -hmm. uh, has surface irrigation of canal water off of these underground canals. And is that is that does that play in that area at all? Are there a lot of those in that area? Does this lateral play into that game at all? It does a little bit. You know, is there a lot? I, I couldn't tell you how many are are actually being used because you know you know a lot of the ditches don't get maintained. It's just difficult for some people to get their neighbors to take care of ditches, and obviously you can't get it delivered. But yes, that is a part of it, and we would have to get you know those shares transferred and into a PI station and, and back out, like <laughs> Travis was talking about, the, the water rights. Again, I'll just, um, it's kind of a side note, but I, I would just encourage us, if we can utilize the already system that we have in place that can take us further away from potable water, because that's part of town that's used surface <laughs> water from the canals since uh, they built the neighborhood. So I, I just think if there's anything we can do to encourage that or help, I'd like to see us do it. Greg Lanting. I wish we hadn't let Brady get out of the room before we ask him. Uh, do we know whether the school district, like Lincoln, is right there? Do we know whether they're on potable or whether they're on PI? Because that would be an if they're on PI or potable, that would be an easy one to convert because that's it's right question. there, and this lot could help us do that. That's yeah, that's yeah. a good question. Yeah. So <coughs> they they have a large we're, area and football big football are, field. We're checking in. Okay. I'm they're on potable sure, water. I'm pretty so sure they are. That's something we might be using that lot quicker just to take care of that. That And that might gain us, I don't know, it wouldn't gain us one a million gallons, but it gain us something. Mm -hmm. So, all right, thank you. Any other comments? Suzanne Hawkins. Are you ready for a motion? I am ready for a motion. Okay. I would move the approval of the request to purchase real property located at the northeast corner of Addison Avenue West and Monroe Street for $20,000. I'll second that. A motion by Suzanne Hawkins, seconded by Ruth Pierce to uh, approve the request to purchase the real property up to $20,000. Any further discussion from the council? Seeing none, Chair, and roll call vote, roll call vote please. 
Sean Berger. Yes. Chris Talkington. Yes. Greg Lanting. Yes. Don Hall. Yes. Ruth Pierce. Yes. Suzanne Hawkins. Yes. Nikki Boyd. Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. <clears throat> Next is consideration of a request to use contingency funds to make necessary improvements to the city pool to meet current ADA requirements. And we have our Parks and Recreation Director, Wendy Davis. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I'm here this evening to ask you to consider a request to approve the use of contingency funds um, to make the, improve the necessary improvements to the city pool to meet the current ADA standards. This pool was built in 1989, and the um, ADA requirements have changed over the years. And the, the most recent changes did not grandfather in older facilities. And so some of those updates need to be made, um, such as uh, fixing the locker rooms, lowering the front counter so that it's wheelchair accessible, um, changing the size of a couple uh, bathroom stalls, lowering urinals, and some of those kinds of things. I, and I added a list or I attached a list of the improvements that need to be made. Um, the estimated total cost of the project is about $32,350, but I guess I would just caution that that's based on estimates talking to um, people that do these kinds of things, but they're all just currently an estimate of about what they think it would cost. And so um, I didn't really build a cushion in for myself with this. I just gave you the, the flat out numbers of what I'm seeing, but I guess I'm thinking that maybe um, if you'll consider approving the request, we either do it not to exceed or give me a little, a little cushion on that in case something comes in a little higher than they an anticipated. So that's basically the request. Um, does anybody have any questions? Don Hall. What is a little cushion with 32000 I don't think a very big. I, I guess I don't know. I was thinking what would be a reasonable cushion? Thirty-five. Oh, 35000 altogether? Okay. Probably. That would probably cover it. Suzanne Hawkins. Wendy, do you know what we do have in our contingency fund now for this? No. Sorry. I should have asked earlier. No, so so this would come out of the capital contingency fund, and so we have the capital associated with that, and that has not um, been significantly drawn down this year. Uh, very few projects have been attached to it. At the beginning of the year, we started with about $150,000 in the contingency fund. Thank you. Don Hall. Are you ready for a motion? Sure. I would move that we uh, approve <laughs> up to 35000 not to exceed 35000 for the ADA requirements that you have outlined in the report. Greg Lanting. Second. <clears throat> a motion by Don Hall, seconded by Greg Lanting, <clears throat> to approve the request not to exceed $35,000 for the necessary improvements. Is there any discussion? Greg Lanting. Well, obviously, it, those, these are one of those ones where we like to throw around up unfunded mandates and all that kind of stuff. But if you look down to the list, many of them are needed improvements anyway. And so uh, we're, I, I don't see myself voting no on something that might end up closing the pool. So I think I will be voting in the affirmative. Thank you. Any further discussion? I think. <laughs> Seeing none, Sharon, roll call vote, please. Chris Talkington? Yes. Greg Lanting? Yes. Don Hall? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Sean Berriger? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. <clears throat> Next is consideration of a request to enact a new Chapter 13 of Title 6 of the Twin Falls City Code prohibiting graffiti, requiring removal and abatement, and providing for a penalty for violation of this code. Chief Kingsbury, welcome back. Thank you, Mayor, Council. Thanks for having me here this evening. And if you remember, a few weeks ago, we first uh, brought this, uh, this code uh, before you as a council to uh, review and discuss. And at your direction, uh, working with our wonderful legal counsel, Fritz, Fritz Wunderlich, we went back and made some changes uh, to the code. And I think it's important to add for, the, for our community that the purpose of enacting this code is not to make graffiti illegal. I mean, it already is under state statute with vandalism. However, the purpose uh, 
why I am asking you to enact this code is to allow us as a city to have some better tools for tracking said vandalism, especially when it is gang-related type vandalism. I would point out that today, if you are a fan of the Twin Falls Police Department Facebook page or follow us on Twitter, two great follows, uh, you will have seen that we posted a photograph of some graffiti that was done to the Disabled American Veterans Hall that was reported this morning. And it was gang graffiti that was placed on, on that building. Um, obviously, the men and women of TFPD are aware of it. We're working with the community to try to find the perpetrators as well as uh, um, to, to work with whoever we need to work with to make sure that that gets cleaned up. But I think the, the timing on that is appropriate as we discuss this ordinance tonight. Just as an example to let you know that we do have gang graffiti that takes place in our city. So again, by asking for this ordinance, I am I'm asking council to look at this and give us as a city, both the police department, code enforcement, and even you as a council, the tools to help us uh, keep our city uh, clean of this graffiti. Um, I said it before and I'll say it again, and that it is not my intention as, as the chief of police to dictate, mandate, or order uh, members of our community, especially those that are uh, live below the poverty line, to have to, to pay a large amount of money to clean up their property, but rather to work with them uh, so that we as a city, we as our police department and our code enforcement folks and, and our great citizens out there can work with them to get this cleaned up uh, so we get it documented quickly and cleaned up. So the changes were made as you asked. Um, we can certainly discuss those. I you think you'll find an appeal process in there uh, that makes uh, you as a city council the, the appellate board, if you will. And I think it spells out very clearly uh, what our intention is. I would stand for questions. Thank you, Chief. Don Hall. I don't have a question for you, Chief. I just want to say that I, I like um, the changes. And, and we both knew what your intentions were before. But again, in 10, 20 years when you and I are here, we want to make sure those following us know what our intentions were. And, and um, I, I like the line about you or your designee will uh, enlist partners to help folks take care of these kind of issues because there are going to be some folks that are living under the poverty level and they need some assistance and this spells it out well and I appreciate you taking it back and, and meeting with Fritz and making those changes sir. Thank you sir. Chris talking to you. Yeah I think there's some improvements to this ordinance make us all happier than the first uh, run around. I especially am enamored with the use of juvies from my old detention center that uh, when they get out doing public uh, pickup or improvement projects and the, the eye of the public is on them, it has more of a shame factor and uh, getting religion factor than about anything you can do behind a, a closed door. So uh, I hope that we can use juveniles that need to work off some, some energy, whether they've been directly related to that graffiti or not. The word will spread real quickly. Yes, it will. And, and Councilman Talkington, to that, uh, I am meeting tomorrow afternoon with the director of the Juvenile Detention Center. Uh, this will be the first time I'll be meeting with him, but these will be one of the things I'll be discussing. Great. Thank you. Nikki Boyd. What I like about it is it shows pride in our community, and it shows that we're paying attention up front, and this is something that is near and dear to our heart, and we're not going to let our town get junked up. And I think it's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Greg Lanting. Again, on the timing issue, I think all of us were certainly appalled about the Veterans Hall and uh, Disabled Veterans Hall. And then I happened to be on a, on a walk last night, and somebody who didn't care for, for Mr. Trump had written on, the, on a fence that particular thing, and I thought, you know, I wonder when that's, you know, I'm glad that that's coming back to us tonight so we can get moving on this and maybe help that community, that person uh, take that obscenity as well as uh, Mr. Trump's name off the off their fence. I'm sure that it's behind their their property. They might not even notice it yet because it's on a different, not a, it's on Harrison there. So, but uh, obviously it will we will be in touch with them to help them get it off there. And, and Councilman Lanting, if you would shoot me an email or a text with the information of where that's located, I'll make sure, sure that we're aware of it at the police department. We will do. Killer. Thank you. Is there any further discussion, Councilman? So, Sharon, do you have an ordinance number? 
Ordinance number 2016-6. 2016-6. Chris Talkington. I would move to place uh, Ordinance 2016-6 on third and final by title only. Second. Would you like to suspend the rules to do that? Do you have to suspend the rules in there? Said that. Did okay. He? Okay. Right. I'm, I'm making sure. It. Sorry. So we have a motion by Chris Doggin and seconded by Don Hall to suspend the rules and place ordinance 2016-6 on third and final reading by title only. Is there any discussion? Seeing none. Roll call vote, please, Sherry. Greg Landing. Yes. Don Hall. Yes. Ruth Pierce. Yes. <clears throat> Suzanne Hawkins. Yes. Nikki Boyd. Yes. Sean Berger. Yes. Chris Talking. Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Sharon, would you read the title, please? Ordinance number 2016-6, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Twin Falls, Idaho, enacting a new Chapter 13 of Title VI of the Twin Falls City Code, prohibiting graffiti, requiring removal and abatement, and providing for a penalty for a violation of this code. Be it ordained by the mayor and the council of the city of Twin Falls, Idaho, that the Twin Falls City Code is amended by the addition of a new chapter 13 of Title VI as follows. Thank you, Sharon. Don Hall. I would move approval of ordinance 2016-6. Second. Thank you, Boyd. Sorry. A motion by Don Hall, seconded by Nikki Boyd, to approve Ordinance 2016-6. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, roll call vote, please. Don Hall? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Sean Berriger? Yes. Chris Talkington? Yes. Greg Lanty? Yes. <coughs> motion passes 7 to 0. Chief, thank you for your work on that and bringing it back to us. The next item on the agenda is presentation to the Council on the results of the 2016 National Citizen Survey. We have our presentation from Mandy Thompson and Travis Rothweiler. Welcome, Mandy. Thank you, Mayor, Council <coughs> Sharon, can you turn on the projector? Beautiful screen <laughs> Bear with us for a moment as we get the <laughs> presentation set up in case you're tuning in online and wondering what we're up to.
How about I'm I'm going to go ahead and uh, recess for five minutes, take a little break while you what all get that set okay. up. So we will uh, come back at about 22 minutes after. Mr. Rothweiler. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Just really quickly before I turn the microphone back over uh, to Mandy to um, begin the National Citizen Survey presentation. Um, we had a um, slight error on the agenda. We wanted to point that out. Um, the motion was made on item number three, and it is a staff error where it says consider the request to approve the purchase of real property located at the northeast corner. It should have reflected into the northwest corner, and that was aptly pointed out by members of, uh, of the audience this evening. And, and so there is no need to change the motion that was made because the intent is reflected by lot and block later in the application packet. But for the record, and we'll make the correction in the meeting minutes to the motion with the council's concern, con concurrence, that it should have actually reflected the northwest property as opposed to the northeast property. The northeast property has never approached us, nor are they probably interested in selling the property for twenty thousand dollars. So if they're watching, and you know how great it is having that mistake come from the engineering department, we're going to give them a compass for uh, <laughs> education. Thank, we were sharing that with John. <laughs> Thank you, Travis. Welcome again, Mandy. Good evening. Okay, I think we're ready to proceed. I apologize for that brief delay. Um, I'm pleased to be before you this evening to present the results of the 2016 National Citizen Survey. We have been on and off the agenda several times over the last few months, so um, I had a lot of assistance in putting together and, and combing through the, the results of the survey from our um, intern in the city manager's office, Jake Lasinski, and we, um, I told him at one point I hoped that we would have the opportunity to present before his internship was over, so we made it. Um, a little bit of background on the National Citizen Survey. Um, this is a um, survey that we have participated in now for the fourth year. It, we do it every two years. So um, we actually did the first one in 2009, and then we started on a every two-year um, platform in 2012, 2014, and now again in 2016. So um, that is what um, some of the background on what um, how often we do it. Uh, the first question I wanted to, or the first um, item I wanted to speak with you about is just exactly what does the National Citizen Survey identify? Um, the National Citizen Survey captures residents' opinions of their community across eight central facets. Um, we look at, or the, citizen, the survey looks at safety, mobility, the natural environment, the built environment, the economy, recreation and wellness, education and, and enrichment, and community engagement. And what it delivers to the cities that participate in the survey is a report about the livability of the, the community in which um, citizens are taking the survey. Um, who receives the survey? A survey, a random sampling um, through statistical selection, um, was mailed to 1,400 households this year. Um, and we had uh, 405 respondents. Um, that is about in line with the national average of anywhere between 27 and 30 percent um, respondents from the initial mailing. And um, the data was weighed in order to reflect the city population. And then the question of how we use this information. Um, essentially what we do with this information is we use it to compare similar, um, we're, we compare it with similar surveys that were conducted in prior years so that we can have a benchmark um, not only of where we've been, but where we've gone, where we've come um, from the past and how we've improved the delivery of particular services to our citizens um, and how the community as a whole is growing. And if there are areas in which the citizens do deem that we maybe um, have fallen short, and then that gives us an opportunity to address those um, areas as well. Um, one of the um, larger questions that's asked in the citizen survey is about the quality of life of what, excuse me, the quality of life in Twin Falls. Um, and I'm pleased to report that most residents rated the quality of life in Twin Falls as either excellent or good. Rep respondents were able to determine that the safety, or determined through the questions they answered, that safety, the economy, and education are the most important factors moving forward in our community. Our citizens rated the quality of life in Twin Falls overwhelmingly as either excellent at 20% or good at 
Um, I find that to be very encouraging, and I think it's absolutely showing the community and the council that we're moving in the, in the right direction, that over 70% of, of the, those responding felt that we are moving in the right direction and that we have um, a very high quality of life. Um, additionally, 54% uh, of the respondents um, rated Twin Falls as a good place to live, and 26 rated it as an excellent place to live. Um, some of the other factors that, that um, played into this overall question of a place to live was that 73% of the respondents um, um, cited Twin Falls as either good or excellent, as a good or excellent place to raise their children. 65% said it was a good place to retire. And 64% that said that overall that we had a, a good um, quality image um, in their minds. So it's a very similar. It's very sim similar in comparison to um, the national survey and the comparisons that they do to other communities of our size. Um, but it's also a slight increase over the last time that we took this survey in 2014. Do you have the comparatives? I do, and I can. Um, I will make all of the. Um, there was probably about 65 to 70 pages worth of information, and so yeah, I'll have all of tree. that. Um, all of, I will make all of that available to you after tonight's meeting. Thank I just you. thought I'd give you a little bit of the highlights. So one area that we grew in, um, in, our, um, in our effectiveness um, is public safety. 68% of the respondents positively rated that the city had an overall feeling of safety. Um, and furthermore, 93% of respondents said that they felt safe in their neighborhoods during the day, and that 87% also rated safety as safety at the places they shop and do business as favorable. So favorable being good to excellent. So overall, our the, the, the feeling of safety in the community of Twin Falls is um, is continuing to grow. And I wanted to share with you. that overall the um, rating of our police department um, increased this year. Um, in 2014, it was at 69%, and again, 69% is either good or excellent. And in this year, um, the 2016 survey, it was up to 75%. So we have a very positive um, response to not only our police department, but also um, we have a 91% approval rating for the fire department. 56% um, of the respondents felt that crime prevention was either good or excellent which is also up. And another category where we grew um, significantly was animal control, which I know at some points have had some, there have been some citizens with some concerns about how animal control has been handled by the police department. And so that's excellent news to know that, that those citizens' concerns are being addressed. This table is just kind of giving you um, an idea of where our population is, has, is growing um, compared to the criminal fences in the community. And just to let you know that, um, I guess it's just a way of showing on the left-hand side you're going to see the population, and on the right-hand side you will see um, criminal offenses. <coughs> this is not actually from the National Citizen Survey, but this is just a, a visual representation that while we do have some increase, we do see an increase in crime in, in Twin Falls, um, it's also something that we have been telling you for a long time is a direct reflection or has a direct correlation with the increase in population, um, but that it's not um, in line with where the crime had been earlier um, in the decades. So that's just a um, anecdotal information for all of you there. Another area where we saw an increase in um, the um, positive um, uh, responses from the citizens that took the survey is in the natural environment. 69% of our respondents rated um, the cleanliness and natural environment in our community favorably. Um, that it was 80% um, rated Twin Falls as a favorable place to live. And again, um, going to, um, and specifically to the natural environment, uh, drinking water received a 58% approval rating. Other areas that um, showed an increase um, um, were, um, excuse me, open spaces and natural area preservation, which I think can also um, be a direct, re re direct reflection of the um, work that we've done and um, the community has done towards um, the acquisition of areas such as Augur Falls and our continued efforts to um, connect the trail system. 
Some other areas where we've improved since the 2014 um, survey are the overall direction of the city. Um, that increased to 61%. The value of services for taxes paid, 48% um, of the respondents rated that as good or excellent. Confidence in city government um, increased. Customer service, and this is directly um, re linked to customer service by um, city employees and city staff. Economic development and the, um, the growth of the economy in Twin Falls increased to 65%. And the belief that the city is acting in the best interests of Twin Falls also increased, and that increased to 65%. Um, that absolutely is a, I believe, a, um, a reflection of the hard work that not only city staff puts into um, their jobs at the city, but also the council, and also the partnerships that we've created um, throughout the community. Um, the, the overall livability report and the quality of life that was reported in this final report um, certainly supports the, um, the statement that Twin Falls is a, um, is some place where our, um, our citizens are proud to be, proud to live, and that they have pride in their community and that they want to continue to see us going in that direction. Um, that this next area, though, is for there are, are obviously, it's not always a glowing report, and there are always going to be some areas for improvement. There were several areas that we saw declines, some of them a little bit more so than others. Um, a couple of things. We, not, we don't always know. Um, why citizens answer the questions they answer and um, how they answer them. Um, we've had some questions as to when the surveys are conducted. Typically, the mailings go out in early January and the, the postcard, because um, each citizen gets a postcard letting them know that a survey is on its way. They received the survey um, early February and they had this year until mid March to, um, to complete those surveys. We try to send them out around the same time every year. Sometimes that's varied slightly over the years, but there are certainly some opportunities um, for maybe the natural environmental factors to um, affect the, the, maybe the responses of the citizens, but um, without a lot of information to, you know, understand how, why they answered the questions, it's, it's a little hard to, under, you know, to, um, to make those, those links. So I'm going to have Travis come up here and he's going to discuss some of the areas of improvement. So, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, these are, uh, I think Mandy and Jake did a really good job kind of talking about the high points and, and some of the successes that we had, and I want to kind of reiterate some of those. Um, because one of the things that's important when you take a look at the survey is the growth over time. Because one of the things that you want to make sure is that the actions that we're taking are sustainable courses of action and we continue to make ground to realize the level of service that the citizens are looking for. So, for example, when you take a look at the overall direction that the city is heading, in 2009 we received 44 percent was either good to excellent. And over the course of the last several years, we've seen increases, and as Mandy shared, it is now at 61% good to excellent. So you can see that that is moving forward. For the values of taxpaying dollars that it received, it's, it's kind of, it has moved eight percentage points from 40% to 48% from good to excellent just in, the, in that past year. And so what we want to do is we want to understand why is that occurring so we can continue to move forward and we look towards that strategic plan? Well, just not only do we look at the successes, but we also want to take a look at those areas where we fell a little short. And these are some of those key areas that we fell a little short. One of the most frustrating things about a survey is it doesn't say why. It doesn't tell you why street repair has fallen each and every year since 2009. When the city of Twin Falls has invested more money than it ever has in the area of street and road construction. It doesn't talk about how travel by bicycle has fallen, yet last year, you'll recall, we took a major street initiative to create sharrows, to create more bike lanes, to go forward and revisit our city code. And public transportation has been one of those hot button issues that we've had conversations about. Uh, it makes sense that we saw an increase in water. 
because we no longer are required by the EPA to put a note in the water bill every quarter saying your water does not meet the standards of the Clean Water Act as a result of arsenic standards. And so when you tell somebody something long enough, it's going to take some time to watch that trend, and we're starting to see that move forward. Parks, recreation, recreation centers, recreation programs, solid waste and recycling. Those were some pretty key button issues, as well as whether or not the city of Twin Falls is open and accepting to individuals of different cultures and whether or not we're open to Spanish-speaking residents. Those were areas that we fell from 2014 to 2012. And, and while we might all take a moment to say, well, I think it's this because of where we're at in street repair, one of the things that my office is going to do, and I've asked Mitch to oversee this process, is that we are going to have some intentional citizen-driven focus groups to have a conversation as a part of the strategic plan to understand why are we not meeting your standards in streets, in bicycle, in, in public transportation? What can we be doing better in the areas of parks and recreation? Because I do not believe that this is a reflection by the effort of the men and women in the department. If you spend time with the men and women in public works and, and the street teams, they work really, really hard, and they take great pride in the work that they do. And it's our job to make sure at, at, at our level that we are providing the absolute best tools and direction that we can to ensure that they're successful, not only from a strategic planning perspective, but also in the <laughs> eyes of the citizen that we serve. So really, the, the, the citizen survey gives us a starting point. It gives us a starting point to ask, why? Why did we not meet your expectations? And so we'll be having a call to action uh, in preparation of the strategic plan because we want to take this information as we launch in September in the recrafting of our strategic plan to take this information, but also to bring more answers to the table than what we're able to present to you this evening. Um, if you're interested in helping on one of those, please let us know. We think it's important to have complete engagement. And one of those areas that we grew was that area of, of pub, in public engagement. And so we want to make sure that we're continuing to engage the citizens. Now, it's a blind survey. And so we will not be able to go out and ask those who submitted, well, why do you feel that we failed to meet your expectations. This is going to be more of a general call uh, to the citizens, and we'll dig deep. We'll understand why. But again, uh, we, we certainly want to emphasize the point that we do not look at this as a reflection by the quality efforts of the men and women that work in these departments. They work very, very hard. Um, we just might not, from a uh, city manager's office level, be providing the right direction to supply the right services to our citizens as they're requiring. So this will allow us to connect better with our citizens, have a better understanding of the programs they're looking for, and then continue to see improvements in these areas, hopefully in the 2018 survey. With that, we'll stand for any questions. Um, all of the citizen surveys will be, I, I believe we have sent those to you pr previously so you could take a look at them. We will also be making them available online for the community to take a look at. Uh, we would encourage the citizens to take a look at it. We believe that this is one of the fundamental report cards that we have. It will help drive budgeting decisions, and this right up there with the audit is a reflection of our overall efforts. And so we would encourage our citizens to take a look at that. And then if they have any thoughts that they would like to share specifically with uh, us to, to reach out. Um, and certainly, again, we'll be making that call to action for citizens to participate. Travis, do those uh, reports that we'll have access to, do they show the trends since the beginning of the survey? That's all included in the they do. in the reports? Yep, Perfect. they do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other uh, questions or comments for Travis or Mandy? Chris talking to you. <clears throat> Just a general observation that I think, especially transportation, probably is an area of improvement because of the growing nature of our community, more vehicular traffic all the time, more congestion. Yeah. Uh, I would not expect that to be an easy one to change. And further, I would expect with our widespread downtown urban renewal going on, we'll probably get hit. Uh, 
uh, in some way, form, or fashion. So that's why it's important to look at these uh, on a comparative basis over years rather than one standing year. I think that I think Councilman Tuckton made really good points there. Just you know, just to really make sure that over the length of the survey, we want to make sure we're marking improvement and, and ignoring those those single blips because we don't know what those particular causes may be. Nikki Boyd. Would you remind me the, of how how the fourteen we we send out to fourteen hundred people? Are those is that a different group of people every year? So or every. St- survey or how, how, how are they selected? So um, the National Citizen Survey um, at the National Research Center, um, we work with them to provide a basic map of the overall city of Twin Falls and then they move forward and they will uh, send out uh, random surveys to individuals that are selected um, and it is a complete random selection. So. Um, we are aware of some cases that, of people who might have had the opportunity to fill out the survey a couple of different times. We're also aware of people who have never had that opportunity. And it's a complete random selection. Uh, it's, it's broke into quadrants of the city. And so we break the, quad, the city into three different areas so that if there's one part of the community that says um, something different when it comes to road repair or road maintenance. We want to understand why does this section of our community feel differently? Uh, maybe they feel the same way about crime or neighborhoods or fire service or, or recreational amenities. What does that look like? Is there a particular area geographically that's weighing the entire survey down? So we, so we look at that. Then what they do is they get those responses and, and as Mandy was sharing, it is weighted in comparison to the census. And and what that means is it will take the demographics of our census and it will either amplify or mute the voices to generally reflect the overall sentiment of the community. So we can also share in some of the demographic profile the sentiments of the citizens who have lived here for 20 years. And so we can kind of take a look at that in comparison to the sentiments of the citizens who have lived here for three years. How do, par- how do parents with children feel about our recreation programs by comparison to uh, empty nesters? And, and what does that look like? Because it really helps us begin to ask the right questions. It may not provide any answers, but helps us ask those questions. Um, that is all fed to us. Um, we, we get the reports. Uh, Mandy had the great pleasure this year of collecting all of the undeliverables. Uh, and then we're still getting them. And so what we do is we take those and we send them back and then they would do a second round of mailings and a third round of mailings each and every time to make sure that we get to a place where the survey is statistically valid. And, and that's what we have in front of you is a statistically valid survey. Um, and so what we can say is we are confident that the survey that was su- uh, supplied and the results that are, were provided this evening uh, reflect the overall sentiment of the citizens of the city of Twin Falls at that point in time. Again, anything can change. There could be a significant event that occurs that could shatter or elevate one of those current standings that we have. Any other questions for Travis or Mandy? Well, thank you both for the presentation, and we look forward to seeing the full detail of the survey. Next on the agenda, we do have another opportunity for public input. If there is anyone here from the public who would like to address the council on an issue, uh, please come forward. Seeing no one, uh, items from the city manager, Mr. Rothweiler. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, just a quick uh, couple of updates about upcoming meetings. Uh, the first is on July 5th. We will not be having a council meeting. Um, as a result of a quorum, and then the second, um, the the second meeting in July, the 11th of July, will be our regular scheduled meeting, and we will be presenting the city manager's recommended budget uh, to you. We'll be making it available to the public after the after the presentation, and when we hope to be able to get your copies uh, the week of the 4th of July, sometime in that week, so you have a few days to to take a look at that. Um, The team is feverishly working on the final document as we speak. 
Um, and uh, we do uh, have a balanced budget that we believe is sustainable that we'll be presenting on July 11th. Thank you, Travis. And then items from the council. Greg Lanting. Well, first off, I would like to let everybody know that I have a little more free time now because I'm no longer president of the Association of Idaho Cities. My term was up last Friday. But I would also like to extend uh, congratulations, uh, even though I tried to warn her about it, but uh, congratulations <laughs> to Suzanne Hawkins, who was elected by her peers from around the state to be the third vice president and thus will begin the process of moving forward and in three years will be the president of the Association of Idaho Cities. We will, uh, Suzanne will make the third president that we have had in recent years of the association as Lance Clow was also a president of the association. Thank you, Greg. Any other items from City Council? Seeing none, uh, we have a, a under adjournment, executive session 74206C to acquire an interest in real property which is not owned by a public agency. And I would entertain a motion from the council on that. Chris Talking. Uh, executive session per 74206C. Second. The motion by Chris Talkington, seconded by Nikki Boyd to adjourn into executive session. Section 74206C. Is there any discussion? I see none. Sharon, roll call vote, please. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Sean Barriker? Yes. Chris Talkington? Yes. Greg Lanting? Yes. Don Hall? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. I would remind uh, those watching that we will not be making any decisions in the executive session, and nor will we return to an open session following it. So with that, meeting is adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>